Thank you for the very warm introduction. I appreciate that. And uh, I'm quite happy to be here in Barcelona, in your beautiful city. Uh, this is my third uh, trip to Barcelona, and I've en enjoyed uh, coming here. And I'm quite, quite happy to be here uh, again for the third time. It's, it's such a beautiful city. You're lucky to live here. And uh, so I'd like to talk to you today about emotional intelligence and skills and how they're beneficial to leadership. And um, as, uh, as Lewis was pointing out, when I first started studying uh, leadership and started studying and teaching organizational behavior, uh, textbooks on leadership or organizational behavior didn't really talk about emotions. Uh, except for in two places, there'd be a chapter on decision making and emotions were described as a biasing factor, something that hindered good decision making, interfered with good decision making. And emotions were also talked about in the chapter on conflict, that emotions contribute to conflict. Uh, and Blake Ashworth and I wrote an article where we said, well, maybe uh, certainly emotions can contribute to conflict, and emotions can sometimes lead to bad decision making. But emotions can also lead to satisfaction. Emotions can also lead to creativity. If you look at the lives of the great scholars, the great creators, whether it's a scientist like Sir Isaac Newton or a writer or a painter, they were very passionately involved with their work. They were not bored, cold, cognitive uh, scientists. Uh, they were very passionate about what they were doing, and managers and leaders are passionate about what they're doing. And job satisfaction, a large part of job satisfaction is an emotional feeling about your job. Uh, so, so I'd like to talk to you today about some of the research uh, that shows that uh, managing your emotions properly, which is what emotional intelligence is about, actually helps you be a better leader. And listening to your emotions in an emotional intelligent way can help you actually make better decisions and certainly can make you a better leader when you listen to your people's uh, uh, feelings and not just uh, lead by the bottom line uh, uh, so forth. Okay, so let's get, uh, get started on this. So I think a great example of uh, leaders would certainly be uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the uh, co-founders of Google. Uh, and I believe that people have both uh, hearts and minds, you know, both brains and emotions. And I personally value both of mine. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be half a brain and, or half a heart. You know, you, you want to have both of them. Uh, it is amazing to me how many people seem to think you should be one or the other, and there's a lot of scholars who seem to take that approach also. But how many of us in the audience out here have both brains and hearts, huh? Uh, I, I, I hope, we, hope we all do, all right? Uh, and so I think Sergey Brin and Larry Page are great examples of that because they're both super smart, definitely high IQ people, but they're also very high on empathy and they value emotional expressiveness. And let me uh, go over there a little bit about their story. I'm sure you all know uh, quite a bit about them, but uh, they had one of the fastest growing companies in history. Uh, in 10 years, they had avenue, advertising revenues of $16 billion a year, almost as much revenue as the four largest television networks combined. And they didn't inherit their wealth. They didn't start their businesses by having mega rich parents who just gave them lots of money to invest. They both had college uh, professors for uh, parents. And so I am a college professor, and believe me, I'm not a billionaire. <laughs> so uh, you know, not giving my kids a couple hundred billion for their birthday gifts, et cetera. Uh, and uh, so they actually earned all that money. Uh, they were math prodigies. So they, they were super smart, high IQ. Uh, Sergey quit high school after his junior year so he could attend the University of Maryland full time, and he graduated from college in three years. Uh, Larry graduated with honors from the University of Michigan. That's my alma mater where I did my PhD, Go Blue. <laughs> uh, and he showed a very early interest in environmental issues. He uh, helped build the 1993 national champion Maize and Blue solar car. And, uh, so very early interest in, in saving the world, you know, addressing some of these key leadership issues like sustainability. Uh, and he also took part in a program to study leadership, a leadership program at the University of Michigan. And so together they entered PhD programs. They met at the PhD program in Stanford and they created the innovative algorithm behind Google's uh, search engine. 
Uh, however, I argue that in order to become a successful leader, they needed to know more than just math. You know, math is not going to make you a great leader. It may help you develop that algorithm, but you need to understand people if you're going to be a leader. And so uh, here's a quote from, um, from my book. I argue that to grow to 20,000 employees, they needed the emotional intelligence and competencies that would allow them to persuade, attract, and motivate these thousands of talented and experienced employees. So they started out as a very small startup. There were already multi-billion dollar companies in the search engine <laughs> field. Uh, they are fighting against uh, Microsoft Internet. They are fighting against Yahoo. The year before uh, they founded their business, Yahoo was on the cover of Time, the founder of Yahoo, as the businessman of the year. Uh, so that's the sort of competition they were fighting against when they started this small little startup business. How could they convince people from those already hugely successful businesses to quit Microsoft, to quit Yahoo, to quit one of those half a dozen other search engine companies out there and go and work for Google. Uh, well, they had to uh, value their employees. They had to treat their employees right. And you might think if you're going to start a business, you're an entrepreneur, you're starting a business, you want to make money, you might think the less money you pay them, the more money for yourself, right? <laughs> All for me. <laughs> Pay them low, <laughs> more money for me. <laughs> right. You know, it's almost inescapable, right? The more money I pay them, the less I'm making, you know. But I think if you're naturally an empathic person, if you actually like other people, if you care about other people, you sort of avoid that trap because you know you've got to treat your employees right if you want to motivate them and get the best out of them. And... Um, so I think they showed a lot of empathy towards their employees. Uh, they were known for giving very generous uh, perks to their employees. I saw a television show recently about this, this guy who was just a cook, and he got hired at this small little high-tech startup company, and he ended up becoming rich. I mean, they could have paid him a lot less than what they did. He was just their chef, you know. <laughs> uh, but they actually like people. They care about people. Uh, they have outstanding relationship management skills, in my opinion, even if they're sort of a little nerdy a little bit. But, uh, and it wasn't all due to them. They did have this guy in the middle there. Uh, they realized they did need someone with leadership experience. And uh, you don't necessarily have that when you're 26, you know. So they did hire in Dr. Eric Smith here, who had... Uh, been uh, a successful leader of a number of other high-tech companies. Um, but they had the final say in picking him. It wasn't just the venture capitalist who picked him. And they wanted, they picked Dr. Eric Smith to help and to be the CEO of the new company because they felt that he had that same values that they had, in part the value of freedom of expression uh, the sort of appreciation for innovation and creativity, uh, freedom of autonomy to sort of pursue projects. Uh, and so one of the weird things is they found out he went to this Burning Man festival. I don't know how many have ever heard of this before. Well, apparently it's some huge wild music festival out in the desert where they build this giant wicker man and then they set it on fire. <laughs> I don't know what... I'm not quite sure what the, what the deal is there, you know, but uh, anyway, it's supposed to be sort of wild and creative and all sorts of artists go out there um, and uh, they wear funny clothes. And <laughs> uh, but any, anyway, not the sort of, you know, IBM straight lace, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, image. Um, but... Now, I think this shows they do value creativity. And one of the unique things about Google is that they gave their Google employees uh, the freedom to work on projects that they picked and that they proposed. They didn't think leadership was all top down. They're the geniuses. Everyone below them is not as smart as they are. They have to follow their orders precisely. Uh, no, they realize they need to hire smart people who have ideas. And they valued that, so they gave them 20% of their time at work to form groups, pick a project, propose a new uh, venture, 
And some of their best ideas, like Google Mail, uh, Google Maps, other things, came out of that 20% project. Now, it is sort of a strange concept of this 20% because they were working like 60 hour a week. So it's sort of like, yes, you have the freedom to come in on Saturday and work on any project you want to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of us, uh, some of us probably have bosses like that too. Yes, you have the freedom to come in on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> and, um, but <laughs> but there are a lot of companies that want you to work sixty hours a week anyway, and they they don't give you any freedom. Um, and if you're a minute late on the coffee break, they fine you. You know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now I I. Um, I know you're all in uh, public administration, and I'm a, a public servant too. You know, work for a, a public university, and um, one of the things that I did like about Google and really admired about them is that they uh, show uh, the founders show great concern for societal uh, issues, and they sort of have a vision that Google is not just about making money, but it's about serving the larger uh, societal issues. And one of the things they deeply believed in is that Google provides information that can uh, better society, and uh, including freedom. Uh, but most time, when you want to, you're trying to build a small business, you think that would just take up all your time, uh, maybe wait 20 years later before you start donating to charity. Uh, they founded their charity, Google.org, at the same time as they held their initial public offering of stock, and they committed and announced to the potential shareholders that they were going to be giving some of the equity in Google away to a charity. And that's actually a pretty bold move that really showed their commitment to it. Because I personally, if I was founding a small business, I would probably do the Bill Gates approach. I'd try to make my billions first. <laughs> Maybe 20, down, 20 years down the road, might give away a little bit of it. You know? <laughs> uh, but they were trying to be charitable right from the start. And I think that shows they had some good values. Uh, and they actually had this really ambitious mission statement for the Google charity. We hope someday Google.org may eclipse Google itself in terms of overall world impact by ambitiously implying innovation and significant resources to the largest of the world's problems. Uh, so that's in their founder's IPO letter back in 2004. And I think one reason why they're able to, to attract all those highly skilled, highly talented people away from Microsoft and Yahoo and the other search engine companies and high-tech companies is people want to work for companies that have good values. People want to work for companies they feel are contributing to society in some important way. And so I think uh, they saw Google as a place where they can do that that Google had good values and that Google was going to help make the world a better place in some ways. And, um, <clears throat> and Google today is still trying to address issues like climate change, uh, disease and poverty. Uh, they got into a little fight with China over censorship of the Internet. You know, they lost a lot of money by uh, not agreeing to allow China to censor Google. Uh, you know, so I think they have stand, stood up for some uh, social values. Um, okay, so let's do a little audience participation if we can here. How many have ever played uh, charades? So, so have you played charades in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 let me put this in. Okay, so, so do any of you ever play uh, sh charades? Do you know what that is? Okay. All right, so what, what I would like is to have a volunteer come up here. Part of what emotional intelligence is, is being able to read other people's emotions. So that's one of the key dimensions of emotional intelligence. And so also, I think, being able to express emotions. And so if we could have someone up, come up and portray an emotion, and then the audience members try to guess that, and then we'll do this a couple of times here. There'll be... Sort of a good way of illustrating uh, emotional intelligence, that ability to read other people's emotional expression. So, so let's get a, a volunteer to come up and uh, start us off here. Okay. And you don't even need to speak English to do this because... <laughs> uh, 
do I have a volunteer? That's right, yeah, so just pick. Okay. All right. Okay, all right, surprise. All right, well, you, did you guess that? Oh, okay, yeah, you're an ex contestant there. <laughs> yeah, you have to pick another emotion to portray. Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> come on up. A shame, is that? Yeah. <laughs> um, no. Oh, oh okay. Um, all right. Um, well, why don't we? Um, well, so, so did you did you get this? Uh, did did you get that one? No. No. Okay. Well, you want to do another one then? Okay. All right. <laughs> Well, so th that the joke is only between the public, not with you. That's all right. I, I, no. I'm easy going. <laughs> Do, do our last one here for us. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Okay. okay, that's always a good one. All right, well, let's give our contestants a round of applause here. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, and so it, it's amazing to me how many different uh, emotional expressions there are and how just a subtle change in, like, uh, a curve of the lip or a raised eyebrow or can totally change uh, an emotional expression. And... So you've got, you know, here's uh, some funny, funny examples here, like comfortable uh, here. What, what, why is, why is this guy competent here though? That's sort of funny. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, now let's, let's say you're a human resource manager, you're in charge of hiring or recruiting uh, new employees. How many, how many of you do that? How many recruit uh, new employees ever do any hiring? Okay, so, so a number of you? Okay. So what are your choices if you wanted to use a, uh, a personality assessment tool 
to sort of pick someone who's high on emotional intelligence? Well, you have three major choices in terms of the types of emotional intelligence uh, measures you can use to try and determine if someone's high on emotional intelligence. Uh, the mayer slovy Crusoe emotional intelligence test is one of the early ones. Uh, Mayer and Slovy were the first sort of scholars to come up with the term emotional intelligence. Dan Goleman was the, uh, the, the popular psychologist who popularized the term. Uh, and they capitalized on this notion that emotional intelligence is an intelligence. And uh, you probably have all taken aptitude tests in, in high school and in college, uh, cognitive intelligence tests. And those usually have like multiple choice test question items that you fill in the dots for and a Scantron sheet or something like that. Uh, so they figured that you needed to have an objective measure, just like you have an objective measure of uh, the cognitive intelligence items. So they developed an approach where you have these right or wrong answers and you're answering multiple choice test questions. So uh, a sample item might show a picture of a face and now you have to rate how much of four different emotions that emotional expression is showing. You know, how much is it showing anger? How much is it showing um, uh, happiness or sadness or fear? You know, and so you have to rate how much of that emotion it's showing. Or they might have a question like, what sort of emotion should you be showing when meeting your future in-laws for the first time? You know, a little excitement, a little nervousness, <laughs> panic, <laughs> you know. So, uh, and the right answer is what the majority of people think it is. So they use sort of consensus scoring. So if most people think this facial expression shows happiness, then happiness would be the right answer. And, uh, and that sort of makes sense because we do use our emotional expressions to communicate to other people. And then in terms of what's the right emotion to show in certain various social situations, that's sort of, you know, being socially uh, astute, you know, doing, you know, what's commonly expected. Um, <clears throat> okay, now the second approach says, well, maybe emotional intelligence is more like a personality trait. And you probably have all taken personality trait measures where you assess yourself on something like introversion or extroversion. So you rate how extroverted you are uh, on a one to seven scale or something like that. And so they measure uh, emotional intelligence the same way, arguing you probably know yourself better than anyone else. And also if you're talking about your private emotions, your internal emotions, you're the better judge of what you're feeling internally than anyone else is. And <clears throat> And also, that approach allows you to judge how you're actually behaving, not just what you think you should do. And then the third approach builds on those first two approaches, but also argues that you have a wide range of emotion-related competencies, like, say, conflict management techniques, like your ability to resolve conflict with others. Uh, so they have a much broader definition of emotion-related competencies and, um, <clears throat> and they sort of build on the sense that it's a competency that can be developed and trained and learned. And so, so what is one popular definition of emotional intelligence? May and Slovy, their definition of emotional intelligence emphasized the ability to perceive and understand emotions and to regulate emotions, both with regard to oneself and others. So you, you know what you're feeling, and you can also read what other people are feeling. And you can regulate your emotions. You can calm yourself down when you start to get upset. And you know how to calm other people down, too. And so they developed this 141-item scale that measures these four separate branches here, perceiving emotions, using emotions, managing emotions, and understanding emotions. Now, perceiving emotions. Now, this can actually be a little tricky because in the work world, we often try and hide what our real emotions are. You know, so the boss says, you don't mind staying late tonight and missing your school's uh, play, do you? 
your son's, uh, your son's school play where he's the star of the play, do you? <laughs> uh, no, boss. <laughs> but you really think it must control fist of death. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> so we put on a fake mask sometimes. So someone who's really good at reading other people can sort of see beyond the mask. They can see what people are really feeling when they're trying to hide their feelings. Um, and it's interesting. They also talk about emotions in artwork and, uh, and um, vocal tones, uh, artistic expression. So one of the things my MBA students didn't like when I gave them this test is it the emotional intelligence, you know, Mayer and Slovy test is it had a photo of a rock. <laughs> they were supposed to judge <laughs> the emotions that the picture of the rock conveyed. <laughs> you know, which, you know, finance and accounting students just thought that was ridiculous. And, um, but, you know, businesses do spend a lot of money uh, on artwork, you know, on the graphic designs, on products in the stores, and they've done a lot of research, and they know that you think like cereal boxes should have a certain color and maybe coffee another color and, and various things. So they actually spend a lot of money on artwork. And how many have ever been to a restaurant and you look at the decor and you think someone paid good money for this? <laughs> you know, well, you go to another restaurant and you go, hey, I really love it here. It's just so beautiful. I just sort of like the atmosphere here. And because they have good artwork, you know, good color schemes and so forth. So... Um, <clears throat> okay, some, some more faces here. Um, these are not from the actual Masit scale. Okay. <laughs> these are not official. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so facilitating thought. Using emotions to facilitate thought. So again, this is quite different from that old approach, which sort of called for people to suppress their emotions in the workplace. And argue you should just sort of suppress emotions, not listen to emotions, not ask other people about their feelings. Uh, instead of trying to suppress your emotions, maybe you should listen to your emotions. You still have to manage them. If you're trying to get too panicky or too angry, you might have to manage your emotions. But also, if you sort of listen to your emotions and listen to the emotions of your followers and your teammates and other people, that may help you actually make better decisions. What psychologists have discovered is that our emotions are, in some ways, a way of summarizing our life experiences. And so when we're in a situation, our brain sort of compares that situation with all our prior life experiences. And if that situation reminds you of situations that have a positive outcome, then you sort of feel a positive emotion during that encounter, during that situation. Well, if you're in a negative mood, if that you're experiencing negative feelings, that sort of gut feeling of uneasiness, that your brain summarizing your life experiences and when you were in a similar situation like this, things did not turn out so well. <laughs> you're about to do something really stupid. <laughs> so, so this is your brain's way of summarizing your life experiences and communicating it to you through those sort of gut feelings. And so when you actually listen to those gut feelings, you can make better decisions sometimes. So using emotions uh, to aid decision-making, problem-solving, and even creative thinking. Um, and so uh, that's part of what emotional intelligence is. It's not always acting highly emotional. Emotional intelligence may actually involve calming yourself down when other people are panicking or getting too, too excited. So emotional intelligence isn't about... <laughs> I'm always happy. <laughs> I'm always highly emotional. <laughs> um, during uh, crisis situations, emotional intelligent people are actually less emotional because they can regulate their emotions to calm themselves down and think more clearly. Um, so understanding emotions. Um, label emotions, match the right emotions to the situation. Um, and this can be difficult because sometimes we have complex feelings. Uh, take something like job satisfaction. Well, sometimes that's hard to know. You know, and some days maybe you love your job, and then maybe on other days you hate your job. <laughs> uh, that could be the same week. <laughs> uh, you know, so so often we have complex emotions, 
uh, trying to figure those emotions out uh, can be difficult sometimes. So, so um, let me let me put on my headset here. So, what what do what are these uh, two thinking? What's what's the lady thinking here in this photo? Does someone have the want, want the microphone to uh, to speak about that? Um, we've got two people with microphones. If someone wants to uh, uh, take the microphone uh, over here, did you did you want to did you want to answer the question about what you think the ladies think in here in this photo? Yeah, I think over here she's she's talking. All right. Okay, she seems to be thinking. What is he thinking? Okay, all right. What is he thinking? Yeah. Did right, anyone want to say what they think the guys talking thinking about? When's the game on? <laughs> What's for lunch? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> all right, so, so anyway, they probably have some sort of complex interaction going on here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> OK. Um, OK, so managing emotions, this is difficult. Um, the ability to regulate your emotions, to think about your feelings, to assess the effect different emotions would have on other people. And this can be complex. Let's say, how, how many are managers right now? How many have uh, followers you have to manage right now? So are, are most of you managers right now? OK, so probably, probably most of you are, right? So what do you do when an employee shows up late because of a personal problem? They've had some sort of personal problem, maybe child care issue, uh, maybe their dog was sick. <laughs> You know, what, whatever. <clears throat> okay, so, so are you going to react with showing some, some sympathy for their personal problem that made them late to work? Or are you going to react with some irritation to let them know they're not supposed to be showing up for work late no matter how sick their dog is? Um, so, so judgments about that. Well, maybe a little sympathy and a little bit of irritation. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so, so these are uh, difficult decisions. Um, <clears throat> and so assessing the effect that different emotional displays will have on other people, that requires a high level of judgment, that requires a high level of understanding that individual person. Um, and so, uh, and also being able to regulate your own emotions. Maybe you want to respond with some sympathy, but you're really feeling irritated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, can you control that irritation enough to express some sympathy? <laughs> uh, okay, and so um, in the Special Issue Leadership Quarterly that I edited uh, several years ago, there were a couple of really great articles in that special issue, and a lot of them talked about how one of the key leadership duties that a leader had was to help their subordinates change from all those negative feelings they encounter at work to positive feelings. Because the workplace is filled with frustrating events. How many have had a frustrating event happen this week? Huh? Probably, probably all of us. <laughs> all right, we've all had some frustrating event happen, you know? <laughs> uh, so the workplace is filled with frustrating events. And so helping uh, followers cope with those negative feelings and transform those negative feelings into feelings of confidence and optimism. So if you're trying to achieve a high level of performance, trying to improve performance, perform at a higher level than what your department or your work team has ever performed at before, which you know, in the work world, we're constantly being asked to do more with less. You, know, you get budget cuts. You've got fewer people. They want you to do more. You know. Uh, <clears throat> how do you build that sense of confidence? And so helping people manage their emotions and change those negative feelings to positive ones uh, is a key leadership duty. Um, <clears throat> OK, so another, another activity is the ability to read other people's emotions. So um, this is a fun little website here. Uh, Paul Ekman is one of the world's foremost experts on reading emotions. 
and he uh, developed a coding scheme that categorizes facial expressions that can help people understand you know, the different emotions that different facial expressions convey. And he trains uh, FBI agents, Secret Service agents, crime fighters, crime profilers, uh, how to read uh, emotional displays and tell if someone's lying or not and make judgments about whether a criminal suspect is telling the truth or not. And there's actually even a television show called Lie to Me that was based on his research that, that lasted for one or two seasons. Um, and then Ekman explains that there are seven universal emotional expressions. Uh, there are other, other scholars who might say there's as many as like 11. I've seen as small as five, you know, but, uh, you know, maybe uh, these are sort of core ones that you can find in every culture, which be anger, fear, sadness, disgust, contempt, and surprise and happiness. <clears throat> and he says they can be hidden in micro expressions that last only 1 25th of a second. Uh, and so he, every time there's some politician uh, caught on camera lying, they would have Paul Ekman or someone like him explaining how they could determine he was lying. So, uh, so when uh, Bill Clinton when he was president of the United States, said, oh, I do not have sex with that woman. <laughs> uh, uh, Paul Ekman was saying he was able to detect these micro expressions. They're only 1 25th of a second long in Bill Clinton's uh, speech when he said that and was able to determine that he was lying. Um, but I have a simpler method to t determine it if, if the politician's lips are moving. <laughs> they're lying. <laughs> But, but anyway, let's see if we can, Paul is always changing his website around on me, but let's see if we can um, just get a short clip from it. Um, so there, there he is. Um, well, okay, let's see, here's the micro expression. Well, here, here's a little clip from this TV show. And action! Was it a little intimidating last season in the beginning? <laughs> it's very weird talking to somebody who can read what's happening to you. So there was a lot going on. And yes, I was self-conscious at first when Dr. Eckman was there watching us do a scene because I wanted to be a good student, you know what I mean? Or do it well. Dr. Ackman, is she telling the truth? She is, absolutely. I am. I guess I would say the inspiration for Lie to Me was that I had been thinking a lot about the things that we don't tell the truth about. I had done some research into the science of lying and very quickly came across the work of Dr. Paul Ekman and discovered that there was this whole science of deception detection. And the nice thing about doing research on Dr. Eckman is that it's right there. He wrote the books. I was actually really into his science long before the show came on the air. I can't get enough of the guy. The way that he looks at people and people's motivations is, is really just fascinating as a fan. He's pretty cool. He, he's obviously a salesman. He used to give away some training tips for free. Let's see if we can get the free. The free. Okay, here's the. Here's this should be the free one. 
Okay. All right. Let's see. Fear and surprise are often confused with each other. The eyebrows are raised in both, but they're also straightened in fear on the right, not curved as they are in surprise on the left. So do you see that? You Although see that the eyebrows right are in a sadness position, the raised upper eyelid and the horizontally stretched lips make this a fear expression. This is an excellent example of the inner corners of the eyebrows angling up in the center of the forehead and the lowering of the lip corners. He's got him really cheap. He used to let you actually practice this for a bit before he would charge you. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, but it, anyway, that's, uh, there, there are some tools out there if you want to learn how to catch people who are lying to you. Um, <clears throat> there, there are other tools also that sort of measure people's accuracy in just reading emotional expressions, like the profile of nonverbal sensitivity that shows people sound clips and videos. Have you ever watched TV with the sound off? And often you can sort of judge sort of what's going on just by the facial expressions. Um, and uh, the you know other ones. Anyway, there have been a number of studies that show that that ability to recognize emotions in other people is possibly correlated with workplace effectiveness. Uh, so it does help you be more effective in the workplace. You have to be able to read people, understand other people, and it also helps in negotiation. So in negotiations, often people try and hide their feelings. So uh, so if you're trying to buy a car, for example, and you're actually happy with the price, but maybe you think you could get a better price, you, you might try and act a little, well, I'm not quite so happy about that, I'm not thinking, I, I'm not sure I'm going to buy, the, you know, get a better offer. Um, real estate, selling a house, you know, uh, you definitely want, to, want the best offer, and even like job offers, you know, are you really happy with that salary offer, but you think you can get them to give you another five grand? <laughs> <laughs> all right, you know, uh, I'm terrible at it. <laughs> I just give it all away. <laughs> they can see my, read me like a book. Um, okay, so so anyway, the second approach, if you're, you're, you want to use an emotional intelligence scale to pick emotionally intelligent people, the second approach is to use these self-report measures. So people rate themselves on their skills. Uh, just like they might rate themselves in a variety of personality traits like introversion, extroversion. Uh, or you might have peers, people who know them well, uh, peer report. So uh, some of the more popular commercially available emotional intelligence skills uh, use a 360 degree sort of process where their peers will evaluate them on emotional intelligence. Uh, and I've done some 360 degree evaluations, they work uh, very well. Um, and one advantage to this approach is that it lets you assess or report on how you actually behave. Uh, because sometimes we know cognitively how we should behave, but regulating our emotions uh, uh, and doing what we know we should do is different. Like you go into a job interview, well, I know I should be calm, collected, witty. <laughs> All right, well, maybe you know you should be calm, collected, relaxed during a job interview, but you might actually be a little nervous, <laughs> a little angry when they ask you some tough questions. <laughs> you know, you, there, you, there might be a bunch of negative, conflicting emotions there. So can you regulate your emotions? So in a self-report major, you go, well, you know, I know, you know, I, I actually I get a little, a little nervous during job interviews. Uh, um, so... You could rate how you actually behave as opposed to reporting on what you think you should behave. Uh, 
One popular measure is the work group emotional intelligence profile. So that has people rate themselves and their peers uh, on, on emotional intelligence. Um, I was actually uh, the outside dissertation advisor when Peter Jordan uh, developed that scale, and I was the first person to independently test it. Uh, Wong and Law have developed scales, uh, and there has been uh, translated in other languages. Uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, uh, Petrides and his colleagues have developed some self-report emotional scales that have been uh, very effective in predicting uh, a wide variety of outcomes. Um, and then these stream three, these more mixed models, uh, they were sort of developed, uh, uh, some of them like one popular major, Dan Goleman and Richard Boyatzis, uh, developed uh, an emotional competency scale that became quite uh, popular. Uh, <clears throat> and they built on this concept that it's a little broader than just recognizing other people's emotions and controlling emotions. So they have you know, uh, 14 separate dimensions uh, in, in their scales. Um, <clears throat> now here's sort of what's funny is some of the people sort of emphasize that it should be measured with objective right or wrong answers to be an intelligence. Started getting into a debate with Dan Goldman about what well, is your scale really measuring intelligence, emotional intelligence, and it's not an intelligence the way you measure it. So Dan Goldman and Richard Warrich just reacted in an emotional intelligent way. They said, okay, we'll just call it emotional competencies. If you don't like us using the word intelligence, so they just started calling emotional competencies, and they just avoided the whole debate. <laughs> and they're selling a million copies of their major a year. <laughs> um, all right. <clears throat> so uh, uh, Dan Goldman, uh, Richard Boyarsis, and uh, Andy McKee wrote this book called Primal Leadership. Um, uh, so they talk about this resonance. Um, so when you're like attuned to other people's feelings and you just sort of feel you're in that same emotional wavelength, uh, like they understand you, you're both experiencing the emotion at the same time, like two tuning forks, you know, that are vibrating in sync together. Um, and so when you're in that emotional synchronization with other people, you feel like you're sharing the emotions, you understand each other, you're reacting to events in the same way. Uh, and so uh, they give a great example of this in the opening chapter in Primal Leadership where this one um, <clears throat> uh, news executive has to go into this, this division of the, uh, of the company that they're closing down. You know, they tried to go into a new line of business, they hired all these reporters, and it didn't work out. So now this business executive comes in here. He's going to be laying all these people off. And now he starts over lunch, starts bragging about this expensive vacation he took and what a great time he had. <laughs> and, and all his expensive belongings. <laughs> and they actually had to call security to get, a, get security to protect this guy so that people wouldn't mob him because they hated him so much. Well, then the... Uh, the network uh, realized, okay, we sent in a real jerk. He was not an emotional synchronization. He was happy. Everyone else is sad. They were not sharing the same emotion. They weren't on the same emotional wavelength. So now they brought in another executive who was a more emotionally intelligent, and he started expressing sympathy and sadness. So he got sort of in that emotional, wow, this is sort of really sad. He was experiencing that sadness with them. And then he started talking about their common values, about why they got into journalism, you know, that struggle to find the truth, to investigate the hard issues, and what their core values were. And he made them all feel proud to have been journalists and to be journalists. And they felt he un understood him. At the end of his visit, they all applauded him and gave him a, uh, a standing ovation. You know, and so when you're in emotionally synced with other people and you understand them, and you're on that same emotional wavelength, then you can lead them to a more productive emotional state. And he was able to lead them to seeing that they had given it a good try you know, with this sort of new experimental news division, and you know, it didn't work out, but <clears throat> it was still a good effort. You know? um, 
<coughs> and so now Goleman and Boryatsis are talking about uh, social intelligence. And when a lot of the work on emotional intelligence first came out, there were a lot of skeptics. And I've been spending you know, over 20 years of my career, like uh, Lewis pointed out, trying to convince the skeptics that emotional intelligence is real and that listening to emotions has positive benefits. But I can see why in the very early days, when there wasn't a lot of scientific evidence, that it could seem like just another fad. Well, we actually have good biological evidence that emotions are occurring. They're real. They take place in the brain. They also uh, take place in our endocrine system. There are hormones that are kicked out when we feel emotions that regulate our moods. Um, so there are specific neural circuits, like mirror neurons. So when we see someone else smile, our brain sort of pictures a smile in our face uh, and sort of creates a visual image of a smile in our brain, you know, sort of using these mirror neurons. And the way they under, your brain understands the emotions other people are feeling is it sort of sends a tiny little electrical impulse to your own muscles that would move it in the, the, to imitate the emotion that we're seeing. And then it asks ourselves what emotions would be feeling if we were displaying those emotions ourselves. Um, so you don't actually, and uh, so anyway, they've done brain scans and stuff that have tracked these emotions. So, you know, these emotions and the way they influence our thought processes are a real biological phenomenon. There's good, good physical evidence for it. Uh, and um, there's Richard Boyatzis. Uh, when he was in a uh, symposium that I'd organized, and uh, I got this image off of Creo, a talk he did at Creo there. But so he was up in a setting like this on the chair next to me, uh, and so uh, he was facing away from the, from the screen. So I projected this right over his head here, and I said, there's Richard in the classic orator's uh, pose. <laughs> so he looked over, and he saw this big picture of him. And, he pretended to be embarrassed and put his head on. <laughs> I could tell he was secretly flattered. <laughs> uh, but in, anyway, there's biological evidence here. So, um, so there are these mirror neurons that mimic emotions. And so let me show you a scientific uh, image of this to show you that, that mirror neurons are real. So, so there you go. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> All right, so, so does paying attention to emotions actually pay off in the bottom line? Uh, does it actually influence uh, job performance? And so I did a, um, a meta-analysis where he summarized all the research uh, on emotional intelligence and job performance. And we also controlled for all the other things that predict job performance in terms of personality traits, like cognitive intelligence. So, so I'm not one of those people who, who think it's all emotional intelligence and cognitive IQ stuff. That's nonsense. You know, you know we have brains. We have hearts. We need to use them both. Uh, so, so certainly, cognitive intelligence does predict job performance. I mean, that's just uh, well known. Uh, uh, but. And other personality traits, too, have also been shown to be related to uh, job performance. So if we want to show that emotional intelligence adds something to that, that you can have measures of cognitive intelligence, measures of the personality traits that have already been shown to be related to job performance, and then including an additional measure of emotional intelligence, does that allow us to even improve our ability to predict job performance? Uh, well. The answer is yes, it does. We can get an even better predictor of individual job performance on top of all those existing measures of job performance when we add emotional intelligence. And so there are these three different ways of measuring it. Uh, most of the research has been done using stream two and stream three. And for individual job performance, when you're working by yourself, for individual job performance, cognitive intelligence, working alone, is still the best uh, predictor. Emotional intelligence is second, better than any single measure of the big five personality traits. Uh, and then the third is conscientiousness. So conscientiousness is that uh, sort of work ethic, 
you know, you have questions on the conscientious of scale, like it's important to me to work on a job until it's done. It's important to me to do the job correctly. You know, things like that, you know, that sort of work ethic. And so what you see here is basically two forms of ability, cognitive ability, emotional intelligence as a sort of an ability, and then that work ethic. You know, and so that's what gets the job done. And those three together, by far and away, explain most of the uh, predictability in job performance you know, based on personality traits and, and skills. Now, leadership is a different story here because leadership is about leading other people. And I think the evidence is for leadership, emotional intelligence is probably even more important than cognitive intelligence for leadership. Establishing those relationships with other people, motivating other people, forming effective teams. Uh, for those things, for leadership, emotional intelligence is probably more important than cognitive intelligence. Cognitive intelligence is still important. I'm not putting down being smart, <laughs> okay? Uh, and people lead in different ways. You know, there are some people who lead more through their cognitive intelligence skills, and there are other people who lead more through their relationship building skills and their emotion management skills. So not everyone's the same. People do have different strengths and uh, weaknesses. Uh, but I did a review where we looked at all the studies on emotional intelligence and leadership uh, in terms of like leadership emergence. So that's where people are put in a group, they work on problems together, and at the end of the meeting, the end of the session, who emerges as the leader? Uh, well, 100% of the studies found that emotionally intelligent people were more likely to emerge as the leader. So, so being emotionally intelligent helps you emerge as a leader. Uh, other studies have found that leaders are, in fact, more emotionally intelligent than their followers. They score higher on emotional intelligence. Uh, leadership behaviors. What type of person is more likely to do effective leadership behaviors, like performing transformational leadership behaviors, which are thought to be uh, characteristic of effective leaders? 81% of the studies found emotionally intelligent leaders are more likely to perform uh, transformational leadership and other uh, types of effective leadership. And then what about overall effectiveness, where they're just asked to rate the leader on their overall effectiveness? Uh, emotionally intelligent leaders, 87.5% of the time the studies found the emotionally intelligent leaders were more likely to be rated higher on overall effectiveness. And so the available research paints a consistent picture showing that emotional intelligence and emotional competency are important to leadership emergence, to performing effective leadership behaviors, and to overall leadership effectiveness. <clears throat> OK. Um, and, um, this was a great study. I was, an, I was the uh, reviewer for the journal, uh, and I was asked to review this manuscript when it was submitted for, uh, for publication. And so I did recommend uh, that it get published because I thought it did a, a really nice job sort of showing the difference between you know, the thing that help you perform individually and the thing to help you perform when you're a leader and a group. And so what this found was that in a classroom, uh, the SAT score, if that's a major scholastic aptitude test, it's sort of like an IQ test given to American uh, high school students for admission to college, uh, found uh, in this college classroom that their SAT scores did predict their exam grades. When they're taking a test, you know, filling in the multiple choice bubbles, you know, SAT scores were a good, pretty good predictor of their exam scores. Uh, the emotional competency index scores did not actually predict the exam scores very well. Uh, on the other hand, when they were working in groups, in this class they had a group project where they had to work with other people, the emotional competency index scores uh, did predict the team project grades. They were a good predictor of that. The SAT scores of the team members did not actually predict the uh, team project grade. Um, and then the team members were asked to rate each other on leadership and to rank each other on leadership. The emotional competency scores predicted both leadership effectiveness ratings and the leadership rankings. Um, interestingly, the total SAT scores did not correlate significantly with either leadership scale. Now, that, that result there is a little different 
from the meta-analyses on, on, on cognitive intelligence and leadership. You know, the best available evidence is cognitive intelligence is correlated with leadership. So, so I'm not trying to dispute that there, you know, but uh, I think the evidence is pretty clear, though, that uh, emotional intelligence is perhaps a better predictor when it comes to leadership effectiveness, and this, is, this study is an example of that. And so how much of the work that you do uh, in, in your jobs, why don't you have a discussion point on this, how much of the work you do in your jobs involves working with others versus being more like taking a test, you know, where you're working individually, like taking that test, working individually versus working with others. Let's see if we get, get a little discussion about this. Um, so who, 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 uh, who would like the microphone to just comment on this point here? I think that most of the, of the time we are working in groups in, in, in our uh, normal work. Okay, so you think that most of the time you're working in groups. All right, okay. There there's might be a wide variety of experiences. Let's see what, what someone else has in their, work, in their work experience. You could say the same, yes, it's, it's, that's true in my workplace, or maybe, maybe you have a different experience. Where you're, who, who also likes to share their experiences on this? <coughs> There might be some jobs where it is primarily individual, you're working by yourself. Is there someone here who would say their job's primarily individual? That's similar to like studying for an exam. Okay. I, I don't see any hands on that. <laughs> it looks like uh, most of us work with other people. Um, okay, that, thank, thank you for help with that. Um, <clears throat> and. It is a little hard to balance your emotions and intellect. Um, and I think in, it's hard to balance those in, in the workplace. The workplace does generate strong emotions. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of intensely emotional events happen in the workplace. Um, sometimes uh, when we're dealing with workplace problems, we tend to just focus on the numbers, uh, the budget issues. We maybe adopt a very sort of Cal cal calculating sort of approach, and sometimes that's the right answer. That, that might be the right approach for certain issues, but sometimes we want to be both smart and <laughs> emotionally intelligent, smart and empathic, you know, to other people, and sort of balancing them both, being both logical and being both emotionally supportive. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's say you're talking with your friends about the economy. And maybe you both think the economy needs improving. And your friend is going, yeah, the economy stinks. And you go, yeah, it could be better. And, and now your friend says, the unemployment rate is 10%. That's terrible. Well, what if you know the unemployment rate is actually 5%? So how many of you would correct your friend and go, you idiot, it's 10%. <laughs> it's, it's 5%, not 10%. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wouldn't have to call them an idiot. You'd go, I think it's 5%. <laughs> I mean, is there a way? How many would let your friend know your friend was wrong versus just sympathizing? Yeah, times are tough. You know, because the, you know, the, the empathic way, if you're just acting purely emotional, you might just say, yeah, times are tough, buddy. You know, versus the, the, the logical way, you're wrong. It's only half that. You know, what? What, what would you do in a situation like that? Would you correct matters of fact, you know, with your friends or just respond on the emotional side, sort of agree with the person? Um, that, would someone like to comment on that? Okay, I bet there's some, would, what would be a diplomatic way of handling it? I bet that we got some diplomats out here who could balance uh, both of those. Some like to give a shot at answer. How you how you sort of let your friend know he or she was wrong, but but I speak in Catalan or in English? Uh, yeah, whatever you prefer. Yeah. Okay. 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 So so um, perhaps I would correct my friend. But I would try to tell him in a smooth way so that he's, he, he's not offended or something. Okay. 
All but right, so you would correct. You would, you would let your friend know the friend was wrong. Friend, yes, I would correct him. Okay, all right. But I can tell you're a kind person. You'd do it in a sympathetic way. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, so sometimes that's difficult to do. Um, and you know, uh, emotional intelligence is not just for these, um, you know, love a lamp loving, Silicon Valley types. Studies have shown it important in the, in the uh, military. Um, <clears throat> you know, partly it helps develop these emotionally competent team norms so people can handle work problems as a group in an emotionally intelligent way, and that boosts the team performance. <clears throat> now here's something that's tricky is, uh, <clears throat> you know, for years people always talked about emotions, biased decision making, led to problems in the workplace. And, you know, Dan Goldman and other emotional intelligence researchers like me realized it, it is true that emotions can cause problems. And one of my first articles in emotions talked about ways that organizations deal with disruptive emotions in the workplace, how you can develop ways to calm people down and prevent uh, embarrassing emotional outbursts or emotions in the workplace causing problems. Uh, at the same time, we also realized that it can be beneficial in terms of building that job satisfaction, building that organizational commitment, building that friendship and loyalty to other people. So it's not just about having conflict in the workplace, it's also the positive side, building friendship, building loyalty, building peer support, building relationships. But it is true that people sometimes let their emotions get carried away with them and they have this emotional hijacking uh, where they sort of lose control of themselves and they have angry outbursts or they panic or they're in fear and they can't uh, sort of control themselves. And they've done brain scans that show that when you get too angry or too upset, that the front part of our brain that's responsible for our higher thought processes or our logical, reasonable thinking or deep-seated, contemplative, uh, philosophical side of us, uh, that that part of the brain begins to shut down, that all the blood flow is going to the parts of our brain responsible for fight or flight, motor, mo the motor control portions of the brain. So when you get too angry, you get too upset, you literally do become dumber. <laughs> you literally are not as smart. <laughs> and how many of us have been in arguments with friends or family members, people we love even, you know, and we start saying stupid stuff, and then the next morning we think, how could I have said something so stupid? <laughs> well, this is the reason why. We literally do become dumber. You know, we get too, uh, too angry, too upset, and uh, <laughs> the brain scans show this. Um, and... The, the flip side of that is this emotional intelligence can help people generate enthusiasm because sometimes the workplace is dull. <laughs> sometimes our jobs are not very motivating. How do we motivate ourselves to get excited, to be enthusiastic for a work task that other people might regard as sort of dull? Uh, I, uh, I worked in a pizza place for years in high school and college, made thousands of pizzas. Uh, and I never got 100% enthusiastic about it. <laughs> uh, but I saw an interview with Tom Monahan, who went on to found, who was the founder of Domino's Pizza, uh, and he worked making pizzas himself for for several years before he started his franchise system. And he, he was he was talking to this uh, reporter about um, how fast he could make pizzas. So he was outside the pizza shop looking at this guy who'd won the record for the most number of pizzas made. And he was talking to the reporter. He said, well, I was looking to make the pizza. I can make a faster pizza than he can. I'm the fastest pizza maker in the world. And he started jumping up and down. And he was like so excited about how fast he could make pizzas. <laughs> and, you know, so, I mean, he just had that enthusiasm for the basic parts of what he did. Um, Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, would get excited about inventory management. Uh, how many of us ever got excited taking inventory? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so, so generating that enthusiasm for those key leadership tasks. Uh, 
Well, you should all have a handout now on, um, on the case called Guts. Um, and so I think it would be a fun way to sort of build some participation in this is to um, read this case in, in small groups and then you know, share some stories about some of those toughest times you had controlling your emotions, uh, maybe where you've witnessed someone um, not being able to control their emotions at work, getting angry, shouting, getting in fights even, uh, panicking. Uh, and the case on Guts talks about the real life uh, examples of this person who uh, sometimes did have panic and fear and other times reacted bravely and with confidence. And so uh, share some of those stories about that and then uh, come up with a list of the five biggest things that cause the, you know, to have emotional outbursts at work or they'd be hard to control. And then those just five little annoyances. You know, sometimes it's not the big problem at work, but like that paper the paper copier, you know, breaking down <laughs> right when you need it. <laughs> little, little annoyances, your neighbor humming that irritating tune all day long, you know, little stuff that might, that's not that important, but sort of gets on your nerves. And what you can do to control all those. So why don't we have uh, some, uh, maybe about half the people stay in here and form some groups. And then we got the, those rooms over there where people can uh, form some small groups Maybe we have about two, two big groups of 20 or so in here and two, two groups in the other room. And then each group sort of just share their list. You know, make a list and then come back here and have, have a group representative read out their list and sort of report on the result of the group discussion uh, here. Uh -huh. 